Welcome to Making Your Miles Count Production, an educational program to all Canadian lease owner operators with your host, Robert Scaper. Well, welcome to Making Your Miles Count, uh, a podcast uh, for independent operators in Canada. And today we have a special guest, uh, Gord Bartley, and we're going to be talking about maintenance. Specifically, I guess your history in maintenance with uh, as a as an independent operator, and maybe we'll start off with you telling you uh, how uh, how'd you get into the industry. Probably got into the industry. Um, I started out in the shop and and quickly learned that the the up and down steady every day was my body was not built for that. Um, so you start to look elsewhere to earn a reasonable income and and. Um, so you're not a, a licensed mechanic? Not a licensed anything? mechanic. But you were doing mechanic, things like uh, uh, tire uh, changes, oil changes, whatever? Uh, differential changes and, oh, yeah. and all the big stuff. Of course, you were always with somebody that well, supervised that right supervisor had was licensed and, and carried on. So we you learn a little bit as you go to start with, but I couldn't maintain that on a daily level. Um, How old were you at the time? 20, 20 20 through 28 probably. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, then uh, had a neighbor that was quite successful in driving. His abilities were were terrific. Um, so he allowed me to operate with him a little bit and I could test and see if I had the ability to do some of what he was doing. That's pre-license. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, what year would this be then? Um, uh, 98 probably 98 oh, okay 1998 um then went for my license probably april of 99 i believe and um and then started out started with with rhymer uh of course you coached a little bit driving with a, a senior operator did fairly well um so you rode tr- team yeah, we did team, um, but it's not really team because one guy's sleeping and one guy's driving, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, shortly, you know, that maybe was a couple of years, and then my wife went and uh, I I started teaching her how to drive while I was while I was around, and um, then sent her for a license to uh, Rhymer Driver Training School, um, and she started driving with me for she drove with me for about two and a half years we were successful she got a little bit sick um kind of in that time frame we had we had bought our first truck that would be 2004 i um was your first truck on at rhymer's no no i had left rhymer um i wanted to i wanted to get away from the double team driving 24 hours a day kind of Mm. a, a thing i guess um so uh, I put it on, actually, we hauled some grain. Um, probably weren't the most successful doing that. My wife got sick. I, um, well, she was getting over her, the peaks and valleys. I um, moved the truck and started hauling fuel. That was probably the end of her driving because mm-hmm. you wouldn't put the whole family in front of a couple of trailers with fuel behind you. Oh, yeah. Um, did that for a few years and um but the money's not very good considering your what you're hauling the the remuneration is not there was not there at the time anyways uh went from there to liquid chemical open bore liquid chemical and did that for probably uh uh, 10 years um eight years maybe and um and did well at that and enjoyed it needed a change and um re-outfitted the truck from a pump to a blower and moved over to to dry bulk and 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 that's what i do now oh yeah uh so uh, uh when you bought your first truck how um how many years had you, have you had you been driving already probably five five years and how did you go through the process of buying a truck well not very <laughs> not very scientific yeah like jumped like jumped in with both feet and um 
of course signed on with a company uh, as as it was happening uh they had a paint code that you that i think they paid a cent a mile more if your truck was white and i bought a red truck so then it immediately went for paint it was like these are these are not wise decisions <laughs> um you never recover the cost it made no sense and um but at the time it all sounds good and yeah. and and you do what you're fed and told jumped in with both feet with very little research and and, and very little um very little support as i know it today yeah the, my the but you did have a background in maintenance i certainly Basically. had a background in maintenance and and fortunately i was you know that's the 2004 is when when the egr system was was yeah in it's probably in its second year um we already knew it didn't work very well of course i didn't but i figured it out very quickly the poor truck spent um far more time in the shop than it should have for egr related issues at 600,000 kilometers i realized that truck was probably going to break me mm. managed to um managed to trade it in and unload it and um so 2006 was my second truck and it's still my truck today mm. two two million plus kilometers and 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 still going good pretty much as good as most trucks down the road was it a brand new truck at the brand time new. In I, I ordered i ordered that one yeah. factory ordered um with some ideas and specs that maybe aren't common uh sometimes had a had a um a little bit of an argument maybe with the salesman that i wanted it this way and we don't do it that way and i we were i got my way and we ordered it the way i wanted it like what 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 did you put in there um a wet tank be between the air compressor and the dryer my air compressor dumps wet air into a tank and then a switch captures most of the water and then goes to the air dryer that is not that's the way it was done years ago probably when you were oh yeah when you were like operating in the 80s or 70s in the 80s um they've gone away with from that at, for the most part and most of the time they go air compressor straight to the dryer and dry that air and then continues on it works it works fine it's it's how almost every truck is built built today i just wanted it the old way the old way um the amount of water I dump out of the tank is sometimes shocking. Oh, yeah. So to me, it makes sense. It might not to um, to other fellas, but uh, I, I wanted the biggest radiator money could buy, and we put the biggest radiator possible in the front of that truck. I knew I knew the EGR would make the engine run hot, and I wanted to be able to cool it as as best as possible. So a large radiator was was very important to me um those probably are the two points that stick out in my mind um oh a special fifth wheel or, or with high risers which which isn't typically normal because i was pulling chemical and and the the trailer has to run at a at an angle and not flat on the did you did you gear like a differential uh um tranny and that did you uh, did you spec it for a specific speed? Um, it was spec for like uh, probably 100 kilometers an hour, or, or or in that neighborhood. It okay. it could certainly do 110, probably at 1600 RPMs. Um, typically rolls down the highway. Would have rolled down the highway uh, at that time. Um, about 1375 at 100, 370 or 37. Uh, Three seven three ratio. It's now been been. There's three nine zero ratio in it now. Oh, uh, you changed to, it to pull heavy haul. Yes. Oh, okay. Um. But the hundred. I mean that hundred. As soon as you start going too much over a hundred, generally the it's most engines start to to be a little heavier on fuel. Oh yeah. Um, and fuel even back then was a little bit of a was an issue. Not quite like it is today, but. Um, always have to have it in the back of your mind sure sure so how long did it take you to get a truck the way you spec'd it <clears throat> from the time of order yeah probably then like uh 
probably pushed the button in February, March, and it arrived like September. Oh, yeah. So it was reasonably quick. Yeah. I think we were still building them. I think that truck um, come out of um, Portland. Portland, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't that far away. And, and it was a Freightliner? No, uh, Western Star. Western Star? Yeah. Okay. I, I visited the Freightliner, I think it was in Portland. Or was it? A, I don't know. It was a number of years ago. I love that. It's a huge, huge area. Would be but, a fantastic site, yeah. Yeah, it was wonderful, wonderful to uh, to see. Um, so when you when you decided to be an independent operator, um, did you classify? Uh, did, were you focusing primarily on maintenance as maintenance and fuel? That's your that's probably your more journey? maintenance than fuel. Um, maintenance has always been right from the the first day the truck showed up in the yard maintenance was a hundred percent my the, the most important thing for me that's what um oil drove and grease, you, so to speak <laughs> yeah it's what drove my i i i eat and sleep maintenance. Think, thinking about parts and and which one should be changed next um oil and grease are cheap um i i can't reiterate that enough oil and grease are cheap i got a, i got a half uh um, uh, um a, a question here you grease. I'm assuming you grease all your own. Uh, Absolutely. You, you grease. What do you think about these uh, automatic greasers? Um, I, I think they're great when they're as long as they work as as and, they and work. they work well. Okay. Um, on the trailers, they work well. Uh, on the tractor, when when you have an automatic greaser, I mean, it doesn't grease the drive line. Anything that's turning isn't sure, being, yeah. isn't being greased. Um, but I think your willingness or your thought process is I don't go under it as often. Oh, yeah. So I don't, for a tractor's perspective, I probably wouldn't myself. I like to be under there because the only way you can catch problems is laying underneath of it. You never see them from yeah, generally yeah, on sure. top. Um, that would be my perspective. That's not to say they don't have their place. They're, they're, sure. they're a terrific system. Probably would help the uh, a, a carrier more often if they put a whole fleet, put a whole bunch of greasers on there. Yes. I don't know if they do that much anymore. I haven't seen that in the last decade. They did for quite a while, and then I haven't and, seen and it. And it seemed to fall by, the, like, when when it's all working, it, it's great. When they start to cause problems, I think I think trying to, to get a handle on the problems is, is another problem, and sometimes... You see um, lines capped, and and the air system it no longer goes to the to the greaser, oh, yeah. um, because they're frustrated or can't get parts or or whatever the reason is. But um, generally, there's a reason why we're not using that. Okay. Um, when it comes to mentoring in the trucking industry, uh, I'm not sure whether you needed much mentoring from a maintenance perspective, but um, were you mentored? I don't I wouldn't say I was mentored. I will say I was blessed to throughout my life and and, and you know from that 27 year old or 20 even um I was blessed to rub shoulders with some really good people. Um most of which I still have contact with today. Mm. Some across Canada that are in really high places um within themselves. Mm -hmm. Or have some terrific schooling, maybe. Uh, maybe I should say. So, when I need to know something, almost never, as far as truck, uh, as far as the truck itself goes, I'm never at a loss that I don't have someone I could reach out to if I don't know the answer. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure everybody has that. It's a gift when you do. And and when you when you do have that, you have to really be protective of it and and respect sure the people that that are on side with you that are willing to to pass a little bit of information to you. Sure, I th I think you have been really uh, fortunate, blessed, whatever you want to call it, because you've primarily only had one truck, especially for the last twenty years. Correct, uh, but but present, it, presently, yeah, okay. 
I almost feel like I have half a dozen of them because I work with a group of guys that that I I bleed a little bit of information too. Yeah. Some on a, on a really um, regular basis. So the best part about not owning five trucks is having friends with trucks that that <laughs> that come to you and, and so you can always compare. Well, and and I and I'm always trying to help them be as good as they can be. Is there that much of a difference between, say, Cat Detroit, uh, Volvo, um, Cummins, and how to maintain them? I I don't have a lot of familiarity with with the other engines. It, it, it's a little bit of a loaded question. I think as long as you change your oil and and your filters and your coolant and your um, uh, crankshaft balancer at regular intervals, that engine treats you well. We're probably not coached in the industry enough about that. We look at our owner's manual and the owner's manual typically sometimes now I think I see, you know, oil changes recommended is 80,000 kilometers. I hope we all realize that that's maximum. Um, I, I don't think the manufacturer is going to say do it 80,000 kilometers every time. If it's, if you're talking to me and you want my opinion, I say 200 hours, 16,000 kilometers to 20,000 kilometers, drop that oil for whatever reason or not reason you have, just do it. So you do your own oil changes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's been uh, over the last 20, 30 years, I've seen a lot of things come onto the market and then sort of disappear when it comes to oil changes. Everything from, uh, uh, you know, wash this out and you get a new oil, you know, if you keep the uh, uh, Contaminate, there, contaminants out. Yeah, I can, um, yeah, all different, all different kind of products out there. So uh, I, generally, I think most of them are, are very good. They're uh, Kevin Rutherford. Mm promoted one I, I don't remember the name um, and it was in and it's a bypass filter I have a different brand on my truck um, been on there since 2006 and a half or something like that pretty much when I got the truck uh, it's a one micron filter only filters maybe five gallons a day like it's very slow but you can't filter down to that micron you know, with a with a two inch hose, right? So it's a quarter inch line, and it's filtering small. And then there's a spinner two filter on my truck as well. Um, you don't quite see it as often as I think we should, but it is a centrifugal filter, and it spins the contaminants out of the oil. It does a very good job, especially if you're running an EGR engine, um, because the EGR is putting a lot of carbon back into the engine. Mm carbon i think on the periodic table is one level below a diamond oh yeah so when you think of diamonds well, diamonds are carbon <laughs> that, yeah. yeah but it so it's, sure, yeah. it's very abrasive um when you can spin that out of the oil the and the, the spinner filters really do a, a good job of it it's a thousand dollar maybe it's more fifteen hundred dollar add-on today put some labor on there two thousand um if you're going to keep your truck and i mean keep it not for four years but keep it for 10 years then it's a worthwhile investment i am how many miles do you have on your truck and what have you all done to it uh two million kilometers plus um what haven't i done to it three radiators um rebuilt the engine three times um of course i had a shop do that that's not my forte Mm -hmm. um what were Same the, transmission. What, what were the issues? Okay, you got 2,000, you, were, you said 2 million kilometers? Yeah. And three builds? Yes. So um, so the first one was at 1.6 million. So I did very well for, oh, for yeah. a Detroit engine. Um, the counter bore started to let go and head gasket started to leak. And so it needed to be, um, the counter bores needed to be cut. And, and, uh, Probably when the counterbores were cut and the shims were made, the there was a little bit of a measuring issue, and one mm. was not done quite as well. So I ended up um, pushing coolant again a couple years later. Tore it down again. 
had all that redone and then had a real unfortunate event probably in 2020 um had about 200 i'm going against what i say now i had about 250 hours on the oil um it was february it was 30 below and um on a detroit the the nipples that hold your oil filters on um are not part of the casting it's just a threaded nipple and the threaded nipple has a habit of vibrating out the oil filter does not turn but the nipple vibrated out oh. so it it vibrated into the oil filter enough and then the filter lost seal oh and it blew 40 liters of oil all over the highway and that's almost an instant engine problem oh um saved the engine uh, put oil in it um drove it back home and uh, or to the shop we were able to or the shop was able to um, um polish the crankshaft put new bearings in uh, the damage was was minimal and um but we did a full rebuild because you're not going to take no, yeah, everything yeah. apart and put old old parts back on so we put all new parts on again so it was a little bit expensive for a couple of years but but if uh if it's the right thing to do you should do it yeah 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 for sure um so you have done three but the last two were probably not that's really it, it, not really necessary shouldn't say necessary they were ne absolutely necessary at the time but they were not uh, due to just regular wear and tear that's there were correct. some there were some issues what, truly when we pulled the oil pan off at 1.6 million the um the shop where i had it taken it he i wouldn't leave until he had the oil pan on the ground and some bearings pulled because i was curious myself mm -hmm. that what i have done has has proved to be valuable and um, he rolled out and looked at me from the creeper and said, uh, you didn't tell me you rebuilt this before. I said, because I hadn't. He said, these bearings, we could reuse them. There's no wear on them. Hmm. Oh, right on. I, I was pretty happy with that. We're going to throw them in the garbage and we're going to put new ones in. <laughs> right on. Uh, what, uh, what do you see as um, some, some issues that are... Um, that are important for the average um, independent operator uh, when it comes to maintenance? I mean, you've gone over a little bit, like obviously oil change and grease jobs and stuff like this. Grease and, and, and oil changes for sure. Um, your trans and differentials, just because the pail or the manufacturer or, or the oil company says it's good for a million miles or kilometers or whatever crazy numbers they use, um, it will go that long for sure. Uh, I think you could cut that in half. Uh, a pail of oil is $250 today, give or take, like like differential oil. Um, it's really cheap maintenance if you're putting 20,000 kilometers sure. on that truck a month. To know that, that you've flushed the contaminants out and the only time you typically see if there's a problem before there's a problem is when you pull the drain plug out and you see some crumbs on the on the the Lighting. magnet of the of the plug right it's an expensive way to do maintenance but um i think invaluable yeah for sure grease what? no we make some really good grease guns today milwaukee lincoln dewalt it, it doesn't matter what flavor you would like to use but they work well um you can generally buy them in a case you can throw it in your jockey box or the truck and um Usually you're at a truck stop for some reason or another once in your trip, whether it's three days or a week or, or whatever, and you can slide underneath and um, and at least grease your drive line. Mm. Um, and then when you're home, grease your slip yokes. And guys, there's a you have to know there's a there's a hole in front of the slip yoke that you reach in with your put your finger on. And you pump that slip yoke full of grease and the first tube will go in there and you will think it's it's greased and it's not till you probably put the second tube in and you keep greasing and you hold your finger on the hole and grease comes out the back of the slip yoke and now it's actually greased the splines 
that's the only way to grease those slip yokes mm. whether it's the main drive shaft the intermediate or interaxle drive shaft or your pto um shaft grease is is integral part of of those slip yokes do you it's use, hardly ever done do you use different grease in the summer and the winter different grease year round three huh. three different styles three different yeah. styles yeah zero one and two and if i could find a three i would probably have a three for that the slip yoke areas and and stuff where i really want grease to stay um what are the what are the zero one and two what do they stand for so zero is like water it, it, oh, yeah. like in the summertime it really does pour like water um one is is for you know let's say temperatures for like today uh, a zero is for like 20 and 30 below it there's a pumpability yeah um to it and and two is a typically a summertime grease so thicker so thicker yeah, yeah. um i will use the the lighter greases in the in the s cam tubes um in the slack adjusters uh, i like to use a, a light grease um there's small you know everything is small little gears in there and uh in order for all that to work the ratcheting mechanism it, it needs a light grease my opinion mm. uh, does is it standard that uh, um, most shops have they do they change the difference or is it always the same or do you couldn't it, answer the question couldn't answer it eh? um seldom because i whenever i go there i see that they just have one place where they pull the, the grease from the grease from and i think well do they change it three times a year I don't think so. No. Um, and for the most part, when you're greasing inside, the number two is fine. No. Um, in the slack, er, sorry, in the S cams, I believe number two is too heavy in the winter and, and can cause you um, a little bit of a brake hang up or, or, or a leg when you re release the brakes. The S cams don't want to come back oh, yeah. as nice. The grease is a little bit heavy. Again, my opinion. When you're greasing, the s cams let's grease them with the brakes released because when the brakes are applied you never get grease to the points of the s cam that need the grease there's oh, yeah. pressure on them we don't do that even in the shops for the most part you know your your typical oil change speedy lube or, or whoever you might go to probably isn't doing that the only time you're going to get that kind of service is when you do it yourself Sure. If, if somebody wanted to be an owner operator or a lease operator, and uh, uh, what would you what would you recommend they think about before buying a truck? Any kind of uh, do they do they choose a particular brand, uh, or do they roll the dice? Or <laughs> I guess it that's a that's a almost a tough question it's a loaded question really <laughs> i um, guess depending on what kind of service you're going to enter into whether aerodynamics play a, a vital role or not the flavor of oh you mean aerodynamics for the fuel for the fuel for the economy fuel, yeah. um the, the the flavor that you like whether you whether you like a, a volvo or a or a freightliner or i mean they're all good mm -hmm. the, every truck is good some trucks are better than others specifically the one that you got yeah I've, i remember I, I was talking to an operator this is a number of years ago and he ordered two brand new trucks identically specced both okay. came off the line and he kept track of them for two years yeah one was horrible on fuel and horrible on maintenance and the other one was good and they were specked identical. and they're the same truck and they came right off the then the numbers were one number difference between the two and sometimes it's just flat out luck it's i think yeah i think a lot of it's flat out luck um and sometimes you can you, you know you can be the best operator in the world and you just have some bad luck yeah. or lots of it but then hopefully you realize that your bad luck is continuing and it's not from your lack of effort and maybe you unload that yeah. truck before it's got two million kilometers and and you're broke yeah because at that point it slowly does yeah, start to weigh on you yeah, right exactly um i remember uh, uh um, i was talking to another guy and this guy who actually uh, worked at a carrier and uh, he says the the uh, basically if you buy a brand new truck 
the first six months, you're just getting all of the bugs out of it. I would probably I mean, say that's uh, even almost the first year. But yeah, the first be, year could be the first year. Be correct. Which is absolutely absurd from an engineering perspective. Because if you think of, uh, you know, Toyota or uh, Ford or something coming off the truck, well, you know what, just uh, turn it off and just do it. And, and, and if they would have that kind of quality in Toyota and Ford, no one would buy their products. But for the trucking industry, it's totally par for the course, <laughs> not a problem at all. Oh, this is just, you know, the first year you got to get all the bugs out of it. And it scares the crackers out of everybody. And, uh, and, and I agree, That's, it's, it's just... <laughs> it's uh, it's a little mind boggling. The engineering, um, it's I I don't want I don't want to put anybody down. So I'll put the whole industry down. Yes, the people who can't work at Toyota end up in the trucking industry. <laughs> That's a that shot be, and a half. <laughs> that might be true. Um, I don't know, but it, it's it's really there is no excuse for the level of the the low level of quality that comes out. In Correct. some of the stuff that they, some of them, it's like they just they weren't thinking when they made it, and they said, "Oh, just do this, and it'll be." And part of that doesn't seem to uh, maybe get better because we're very good as as whether it's it's large companies or owner operators. Um, we just drink the Kool Aid, and when the truck is broke down, you have no choice but to smile and say, "Okay, when will the parts be here?" or or how long to fix it and if it's a three days or a week um you just stay home and uh and your income level drops for that month because the truck isn't operating but you still make that payment yeah yeah and i think if this will never happen but if we um had a standard that after you know three days the oem and sometimes the government um entities that control you know the EPA and and places like that that they're on the hook for that truck sitting there because because yeah. it the stuff on there doesn't work and the manufacturers I don't believe any one of these manufacturers wants a $25,000 piece of uh, tin can on the side of the truck um trying to burn off exhaust and and hope it works yeah they don't want that. Yeah, they they want it to work for sure, but I think what they really did, like the the biggest problem that the trucking industry has seen in the last twenty years by far, is the uh, pollution control emission stuff. Correct, and that's what I'm referring. Yeah, to. Yeah, that's right. And it and and realistically, uh, um, the the legislation, if I remember right, legislation they started talking about it in 1996, 97. And they really and they got it all passed around ninety eight ninety nine something like that and the it started being implemented two thousand one two three somewhere in that in that area because I remember all of the the big maintenance or or the big uh, push to uh, of the emissions in nineteen ninety nine um, I, I remember one there was at least two uh, um, publications maybe even three where they basically said uh all these new emissions fabulous 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 and everybody had this exact same line and it will not affect your fuel economy and it will not affect your fuel economy and the, by the time i th heard it the third time i'm going uh this kind of sounds rehearsed i don't even know if they know i think they 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 were pushed um a project that nobody was prepared for and so they had to quickly jimmy rig this and jimmy rig that and they slap and, this on and slap you, this and try and make a humongous industry squeeze through a little tiny needle and and you know like in and, and i could be off on my dates but i'll say 96 97 when when the n14 come out and the n14 um select plus they went from a mechanical to a to a to an electronic engine mm -hmm. electronic injectors and you could leave that truck, you know, 98, 97, 98, 99. You could have it in the shop and idle it in there for four, four hours and not really think about it because it was pretty clean. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure they run that clean today. Oh, yeah. But it didn't have all that extra shenanigans. So when that breaks down, you, can you imagine you, you have a, a $65,000 engine in front of you and... Um, 
and you call up the, the the one box typically on the on the freightliner side anyways um is about twenty five thousand, i think to replace it the complete the complete unit you haven't done anything to the power plant yeah yeah this is just exhaust after treatment it's absurd to think that that that's a maintenance item yeah that's someone that's else's a, problem because it doesn't increase the value of the vehicle at all no it when, decreases yeah <laughs> so, well i mean if you if you repair it i as an accountant i've seen far uh, i had one client a wonderful uh wonderful team they drove uh they bought a brand new uh, um uh, vehicle and they drove the first year was okay it was all under warranty but they put so many miles on it they got into the second year and they spent thirty thousand dollars just on the emissions, and no maintenance, and uh, and nothing else on emissions, just thirty thousand dollars on that. And so they him and hot him and hot, and then the next year they spent forty grand, and then they sold the truck, and it they spent I think about two years to get out of debt, uh, of their situation. Yeah, sure. And so their entire thing, like they 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 worked harder than like. They were hard, and they did, and yet, and they lost, I think, good three or four years of their life. Yeah, and they and they. And as started. you're going down that slippery slope, yeah. you're working harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're trying harder. You're working harder. You're you're home less, um, just to just to pay for something that doesn't work. Yeah, and I'm all, and I'm all no for accountability <laughs> for that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's the entire industry um, uh, was. Uh, was very disappointed in itself i think to some degree that uh that their performance wasn't uh wasn't as good but i mean to some degree the legislation pushed too much too fast too quick and made it impossible for a huge industry to change and move that much we're probably seeing that presently with electric vehicles yeah exactly Same, right yeah i uh there's no way there there's <laughs> the the new legislation that came out it's Oh, I'm so I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed that whatever. There's no what. What did they say? Twenty thirty. Twenty thirty or uh, twenty thirty five maybe. Or, yeah, something like that. There's no nothing but electrical vehicles yeah. being sold. Yeah. Well, that's not that's not even practical. I mean, no, I, I, they have to have started building uh, hydroelectric dams and uh, and um, nuclear power stations five years ago in order to meet that in twenty thirty five. It's well, like. Oh, and and uh, there's no way. And the um, what do you call that to get the, the approvals for for the dam, whether it's yeah. a dam or a or a or or anything else, takes five to ten years. Oh, like it's, in in today's politics, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absurd. I think it's just wishful thinking. I just like after the a while, transfer of wealth. Yeah, there's people getting wealthy over this. That's all it is. That's yeah. And so realistically, from a lease operator perspective or owner operator perspective, you know what? Whatever they say on the media, I just put way to the side. Okay, what am I dealing with right here, and what's my best choices for me? Like uh, that's the only way that a, that an operator really can uh, make it for the future. I think they have to look only for themselves and don't don't you know hitch their wagon to to some media or some uh, flashy new. Thing that's coming down the pike that's that's for the for flashy sure. new stuff has to be out for 15 years before you really yeah. buy into it it yeah. has to be that proven and we haven't proven it yet yeah. on, on on you know in the in the new trucks we make them fancier you know they're they're nice to get into uh, some of the new trucks i have looked into i mean they're they're almost like really? getting into a european yeah, truck exactly. right very nice um but can you get in them every day and drive down the road i'm not positive in if uh, in your opinion, um, an independent operator, how do how do they get into it? How do they they buy a truck? How long do they keep a truck? I remember when I was when I was driving uh, back is this back in the nineties. The general understanding is you buy a brand new truck, you drive it for four or five years till the warranty is off, and then you trade it in. That was the going concern back then. Um, I, right now, from an accounting perspective, I don't see that is even possible, feasible anymore. I don't see it. It's, it's, I've never done it like that. I got rid of the first truck because I could see that it was going to be a problem, not because I wanted to get rid of it. The truck itself was good. Um, the, the emissions was going was gonna to be a problem. I don't really have experience with the continual trade-in. I, I, I wanted to get out from underpayments, not keep making payments for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. 
that's why we we um, continue with the with the truck we have. And once you operate that truck for a while and and you make some repairs to it, you start to learn its weaknesses, its pluses. Um, you can plan for the weaknesses. Mm. Um, and you start maybe stocking some parts, but the parts you stock today aren't going to fit the truck tomorrow. I am. So getting out from under the payment, I think, is, is huge. That's the number, yeah. and, and, and today, I'm not sure how, because the money really hasn't changed. I don't believe, you know, I'm not necessarily on the highway anymore. You would know these numbers better than mm-hmm. me. But I don't believe the numbers have changed dramatically that you know uh, in 2006 a truck was worth 175,000 and today it's worth 350 the money isn't there to make those payments no. yeah the, uh, for the for the most part somebody with a $30,000 truck is getting paid the exact same cents per mile as somebody who who has a $200,000 truck and 200 uh, you're lucky to find one for 200 yeah <laughs> um, and so it's there's uh, there's such a huge disparity out there and uh, and it primarily has to do with the, the 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 new new prices going up now not not just that it like i remember uh, i did an engine job on my mine it cost like 11 grand or something like 10 and a half 11 grand like today i think the bare bones would be like 30 30,000 or something you, like that you, you know? have to really have some good people in some high places or or whenever in, to in, get 30 <laughs> To, to do it for 30 really it's yeah. doable i i probably have done it yeah um but i've but i've made some very good acquaintances and friends and and people to stand behind me over the years i'm not sure it's that easy um because the like a little bit to what you were saying before where uh where they're reburning some of the carbon and stuff like that and in, in these in the in the pollution control stuff that heats up the uh, the engine stuff what is the long-term projection if you used to be able to get you know one and a half uh, million k's out of an engine or one or one and a half million i don't think you're uh, on the newer trucks i don't think you can get that length anymore um, it's my, i'm it's my personal opinion i, I haven't seen any, i haven't seen anything I, like that i think we're egring less i think they're still on there for the most part mm-hmm. but less because we have so much after treatment okay so um and that's the one box on the side you typically see um with the dpf filters um that you have to you know take in every whatever the intervals are i don't know them um and and either replace them or have them cleaned whatever makes the most sense i don't know that but we're probably egring less and putting less exhaust into back into the intake nevertheless probably there are there is some and 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 really there should be none yeah. your engine truly needs fresh air to burn the hydrocarbon and yeah. and um propel you down the road yeah well that's uh where do you see um um the the industry long term long term uh, in terms of the lease owner operators in a rough place in a rough place um are they all going to have to have old trucks and it, be mechanically inclined if we kind of keep going down the road we are uh, probably because i think it starts to get very difficult to work on the new ones that the electronics is getting getting um uh what's the word i would be looking for there's so much electronics on the new ones the average person um is is not a rocket scientist and you yeah. almost have to be one to to go in and read codes because everything is about codes if you can't read the codes uh you you're not going to look at it or listen to it with a screwdriver in your ear against a valve cover and say oh there's a lifter uh making noise uh, that probably doesn't happen too much today yeah it's not easy for a uh, for a fella to do that in their own yard is there is there more and more available for truck drivers to actually be able to read the codes themselves and find out what themselves what it is? There are some code readers. But is, is that more clumsy. of a black market? <laughs> I don't know. It's it's they're available. Um, does it 
get you in trouble? Possibly. You have to be really good. To mm -hmm. read the code, I mean, there could be three different sensors that flip oh, yeah. that code, right? Um, and hope it's a sensor. So it's a good thing to have. And if you can learn how to use it or, or, or be around somebody that can teach you how to use it, it's not a bad thing to have in the truck. Um, I wouldn't rely on it. If you're going to have that, at least go to the next step and have all the sensors in your truck in the bunk. Oh, like a spare on everything? On everything. It's 9 o'clock at night and you're between Hearst and Long Lack and the crankshaft position sensor says, I'm not working no more. Oh, yeah. But then you'd have to know where it is. Absolutely. But but that's a little bit educating yourself and taking an, taking an interest in that $300,000 investment that you have. Yeah, I am. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Which part? <laughs> you got to learn a lot. There's you, a, it, like... There's a... There's uh, a there's a guys huge... want to get into a truck and they don't want to think. That's the problem. Uh, that, unfortunately, that's probably the problem. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's a real risky venture unless you really tow roll trucks up your are sleep. very expensive. Yeah. Um, you're sitting on that side of the road. I, I just don't. Uh, that's not an option for me. Uh, I, not to say I haven't been towed. You know when a when a bearing goes in a differential and, and you can't move, you can't move and you have to call a tow truck. Yeah. But it's not an op the it's not an option. Yeah. Breakdown is not an option to me. Yeah. Do you have um from a financial perspective, do you have a sinking fund for different so things? When you say a sinking fund, I, I think the answer is no, but but elaborate on that because yeah, yeah. a sinking fund is is basically well, I'm going to need tires in uh, in a year, so I'm going to set aside uh, an extra five grand in my maintenance. Yes, I do that. I don't have a maintenance account. I don't operate. Uh, you know, lots of guys have a maintenance account. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that. I do have some money set aside for tires. I run, I run two sets of tires, two sets of rims. Change them in the spring. Change them in the fall. A little better rolling resistance in the summer. Mm. Um, and, and maybe a little bit less rolling resistance for the winter, but a little better traction for the winter. I like to run new steer tires for the winter. I'll run the half, you know, the, the 930 second tread in the summer on a steer all day long. I try to run almost new steer tires in the winter. That's just me. It's, what What is the, what's the, what's the reasoning behind that? Uh, traction and, and steerability for the steers. Um, I want, you want, I want a little bit of tread that, that the tire has some movement mm -hmm. um, that it will grip on a little bit of ice or, or whatever. That's mm. my opinion. It's an mm. expensive way to operate for sure. Tires are upwards of $900 of a tire today. If you're going to run a real tire, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're seeing a lot of, a lot of offshore tires that, that hold air and, and probably work good for a lot of guys. That's not the flavor I does it I does run. it depend on where you go and what terrain you're going probably mm -hmm. um like winter you... time you know in in Canada, like whether you go south, east, or west, at some point in time you're running into lousy conditions, yeah, do you need a tire that has a little bit of traction for on the highway for sure um do you need as an aggressive tire? as as um if if you spend your life in british columbia climbing the coquihalla probably not do you need a set of chains on the truck regardless yes yeah um do we have chains on the truck sometimes not hmm. do you I, mostly do prairie or um, mountains or? western canada western um in in what I do, sometimes I, I throw chains twice a day or three times a day. Um, I think everybody should have them, should should know how to use them. When when fellas are not positive, and you want to look Robert up and ask him to get a hold of me, I think I'm more than happy to try and. Uh, offer some time and 
correct that problem in the industry with a few guys. I mean, you can't fix everything, but yeah. golly, the accidents sometimes we have on the highway could have been averted if we would have thrown a set of chains, got off a highway park somewhere and shut her down for the night. Yeah. Biggest thing is uh, is impatience, probably. And and not knowing and lack of training. I'm not yeah. I'm not even sure. It's not fair for me to say, but I'm not even sure if we really teach chaining in the in the driving schools. Oh. Um or teach it well. And and guys have to have to have the opportunity to learn that it's actually not that hard and you get a little bit dirty sometimes. Yeah. Um you know, you're underneath the truck and whatever. But there is a way to put them on to keep them on. If you're going to put them on so they end up on the inside of the tire between the tire and the frame rail um, and rip air lines off and and cause all kinds of other damage yeah um, and you've seen a little bit of this on you know what uh, uh youtube's on, <laughs> you uh, well you, yeah youtube and and the the, the highway through hell show oh, yeah. um the, the the tow truck operator in the green truck i just don't remember his name now but you know you always see him with that that machine is chained up like crazy and they're on tight and they're on properly and and he goes out and does a good job and and he's messing around with a few guys on the on the hills out there that don't have them on yeah and should have them on yeah but we can use them here in manitoba too right like they're you don't have to be on a hill like that in order to need chains you can be coming out of somebody's driveway and chains would do you a lot of good because the the alternative is you go get a farmer with a tractor yeah. <laughs> and he hooks onto the front of your truck and one too many pulls and your hood is that far away from your cab. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now that truck's down for a month or better. If you can get the parts, yeah. it, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, what what do you haul on a regular basis? What kind of weights? Uh, 63.5, um, dr dry bulk, like cement and sand and... And so, okay, so you're hauling heavy, hauling heavy, yeah, hauling heavy. You and you also back up. I back up. You back up a lot. Yes, <laughs> that's uh, that's something. Uh, I, I was talking to the other the other guys here that we have uh, on the podcast, and there's no way that I could back up a uh, like a super B or or any kind of train. Everybody can can do it. It's it's whether yeah, you want they do they do it wrong. I would do it, but I would do it wrong. But, but, we, <laughs> but we all d do it wrong to start with. Because if, you, if you've never been in that position, how yeah, could you do it right? Yeah. So if you take the interest to learn, you're yeah. fortunate enough to be around people that can teach you and you're willing to listen. That's, those are double negatives. When you have to, when you have to back up uh, Super B, that's, you're do, working with double negatives, right? That's right. Because you, you're used to moving your steering wheel one way and, oh, no, you got to do it the other way. And then you got to... Yeah, no, I'm not. I got it. I'm too linear thought to do that. It, it, it's doable, but it takes lots of practice, yeah. and it takes lots of willingness to to try and learn and listen. Um, you know, the kind of backing I do a lot of the time is 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 we use uh, a guy a guide. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, there'll be a few of us on premises. Um, the, the old way was was with hand signals and in the dark that proved to be sometimes dangerous um we've a lot of us have gone out and got walkie talkies and and we can talk to each other and and some of us can back the other one around corners up hills down alleys in the dark no flashlights and not hit anything wow um but because we trust the other yeah. You know, whether it's me on the ground or I'm in the truck, I, you, we truly, some of us, put blindfold on our eyes and back up listening to the radio oh, really? and, um, and, and get it where it needs to go. That takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of trust. You have to trust the guy behind you. Yeah, yeah, and if yeah. you don't trust the guy behind you, um, then you probably shouldn't be there because yeah. it's very difficult for the poor guy behind you. It's 30 below. Um, sometimes what should take five minutes takes an hour to an hour and a quarter and that's not fair to the guy on the ground no, no. freezing his tail off yeah. trying to tell you how to steer the truck and and he knows what you need to do yeah 
and sometimes if we you know we don't do it so it's an important aspect of um but that that even goes in a parking lot of a you know in a in a flying j or, or whatever in in headingly or calgary or whatever if there's a fella backing in and you get out of the truck and and, and help him and if he's listening boy you got yeah, yeah. you can back in blindside and and um Okay. nobody hits anything nobody heard anything but we're we're too quick to pull out the phone and videotape the guy backing into something instead of getting out and helping him yeah 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 it's yeah, all that, about tiktok today well, yeah <laughs> I, 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 sadly <laughs> and clicks whatever yeah the, the uh um you you mentioned before you you, uh, you don't do everything in a parking lot and uh, in in uh, flat hard ground sometimes you back up uh, in farmers fields. In farmers fields, <laughs> that must be a trip. Oh my goodness! Like there's lots of restriction on the trailers or, or on the wheels, if you will. So as you're backing, the ground is pushing, pushing against you, um, which which on top of the double negative causes the the both fifth wheels, the fifth wheel at the tractor and the fifth wheel between the trailers to want to want to bend, um, and ideally you want to back them up straight. Yeah, but keeping them straight when the ground is pushing against the pup means that the lead is <laughs> going to try to kick out. That's how it's like trying to balance on top of a a, a beach ball on water. You know, <laughs> you just want to flip around. <laughs> it you, you sometimes know. probably that's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and the deeper the deeper the dirt or mud or or whatever, um, you know, and 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 then to complicate that, we do it in the rain. Uh, we do it. Oh in, my goodness! Yeah. We do it in the mud, uh, sometimes almost knee deep. Oh my goodness! Um, so that's a double set of uh, that's chains on on every every axle and chains on a steer. Yeah. Um, and the trailers are sliding. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, oh yeah, it's it, it can be a challenge. It could be very 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 much so. So where do you uh, where do you see um, maintenance going in the next five to ten years? Um, if we if we take a look at the history, I, I actually am a huge fan of uh, of uh, of the industry. In I think it was two thousand and five, two thousand and six, whatever it was, where they went electronic because everybody got a big, a much better fuel economy uh, in there. Uh, it, it, or are you a mechanical? No, fan? electronic. You mean electronic Just, injectors? And, yes. And, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but then after that, that was the last great engineering that's correct uh, I, I would everything be, else would just be my belief slowly well. went down after and then it went down faster and faster and faster um and it went horrible it probably bottomed out 2016 17 18 19 somewhere in that area we're it, probably even not bad at 2014 2014 i, I think yeah I because have a, there the fuel economy was just getting worse and worse and worse and it only started rebounding Somewhere around 17, 18, 19, I thought. I work closely with a few guys that are between uh, 2014 and 20, 2018, maybe. Mm. They do pretty well. Yeah. Um, of course, we're heavy hauls, so fuel economy maybe isn't top of the priority. It's very difficult to achieve. Yeah. Um, but overall, maintenance the guys are doing pretty well of course that's the freightliner western star side for for where i'm at mm -hmm. i don't see too many of the other brands maintenance is a big piece of it the fellas that are close to me do maybe maybe you, you would say extreme maintenance you might call what i'm saying is extreme maintenance but mm. but they do this um and that probably, I like to think, ho pays off for them. Um, I, I have I have probably a good half dozen or eight, and maybe even uh, ten uh, people. What I would classify, or maybe you would too, as extreme maintenance. Like I mean, they rip, you know, you would cl definitely classify into what most people would call extreme maintenance. I think so. But I don't. I don't see. I. I, I would say every single one who does extreme maintenance. Is all successful. I, I've never seen anybody who is extreme maintenance and then they uh, 
uh, you can't go, go down. Yeah, things go downhill. It, it's uh, it's sort of like you, you got the other. It's you a, can flip it around, and, and and you have people who are successful and do no maintenance or the, very and little. There's lots of guys that, yeah. that are lucky like that. Yeah, they're, they're they truly, are lucky. Yeah, truly are. But it catches up. Yes, it, it eventually catches up. Sometimes you might <laughs> think to yourself, "Holy cow, I'm." You know, I spent three days working on my truck, and that guy's at home, and and yeah. But eventually, that's going to catch. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I'll let you. I uh, there's a, <laughs> there's a thought, and it, and it just and it just left. Okay, um, but no, I, I but just just from uh, um, uh, extreme maintenance does pay off, and I've seen a lot of guys saying, "Hi, oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, in six months, I got to replace my alternator because it, that's your." And then they have this list that they go down. Do you have a list? No. No, you don't have a list. Don't, Is it all in your head? It's or? all in my head, and it's all what I did, what I decide. So if I, you know, simple as a shock. So if a shock starts to leak, yeah, not not oil all over the place. I just see a little bit of a sweat line. I already know shocks are are due, but not just one. All change four. them one, change them all six, yeah. and the bunk shocks. So my truck, there's another four, um, and. and you know, I think uh, last year or two years ago, I had a shock leak prematurely. Mm. I just order them all, oh, yeah. and I change them all. And and the key when you're changing stuff like that is new bolts, new hardware, and never sees. Boom. Never sees is probably one of the most important aspects of doing your own maintenance. The shops typically don't have the time or take the time to put that on but it I mean you smear never sees on that bolt from from tip to tip uh the next time in a year or two or four when you take that piece off almost always that bolt's going to come out for you without an air hammer without a sledgehammer without a chisel mm. without heat it's going to come apart um and so everything on my truck that i've touched you would if you were working on it or you bought it from me, you would know that I've been there because there's never sees on everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, I mean, other than the points where it doesn't belong. Yeah. Um, but but if it can be there, it's there. Uh, never sees is an integral part of maintenance. Does nothing but make your life easier the next time. And yeah. usually the next time is on the side of the road because something <laughs> failed and you're laying with your feet sticking out and cars driving by trying to get something apart and it's really nice when it you're pretty confident you put two wrenches on and 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 you could get it apart yeah. that's important yeah i got a, i got the a, a super loaded question how would you buy a used truck what steps would you go through how long would, would it take oh probably um if i was really after it i would try to find one that that i knew that i've watched somebody else operate which is not happening. Um, <laughs> would golly, you would you difficult. buy it from a carrier, or a dealer? No, no, no neither don't. one. You Car only from another owner operator? Probably carriers mm. for the most part. No, no um, disrespect, but mm -hmm. carriers buy trucks to run down the highway, not to repair. So they buy new oh, yeah. trucks. Um, they probably are. They're on the a most, two or three year cycle. Where, that's right, yeah. and they maybe get two or three year of oil changes. <laughs> And maybe never differential and transmission changes. Oh, yeah. uh, now on the automatic side, because we're making almost, it's very getting very hard to have a manual transmission or to buy a truck with a manual. Sure. Um, we're making it. We're making it like a car. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe the automatic side, it the the fluid changes are maybe a little bit more often. I hope. Um, but I know I know companies that have it factored and and done on paper it makes no sense to them to ever drop the oil out of a differential I am. because if you do it the way i do it 250 <clears throat> uh, times two differentials is five and you do it maybe one and a half times a year um times five years well the, the differential is cheaper to replace yeah, than, yeah. than the oil so from a company standpoint it makes sense and it works yeah, yeah. Same on the transmission. They never, as long as the transmission doesn't have a leak, that's the same oil and it goes out the door with the same oil. So that's not my, wouldn't fit my bill. I would I would be afraid I'm buying a problem 
and usually the company trucks um, from most companies have had, you know, their training trucks. They've had lots of guys in them. Um, mm. We're slowly seeing <clears throat> less of the old fellas that really know how to drive. Yeah. They're leaving the industry. Yeah. Probably. Retiring. Well, retiring and running. I, like, yeah. it's not like it used to be, right? You can't even stop and have a meal anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. So you would uh, you would first of all search for existing uh, operators. Yes. And uh, uh, keeping your ear to the ground to anybody who um, knows um, somebody knows somebody or um, is is uh, is somebody's getting out of the industry for various reasons. Correct. That kind of, um, that kind of thing. Y- and then. For- yeah. And then what? You take a look at the truck and take a look at the truck and and it's a little bit of a hope for the best. Yeah. Because you can't see <clears throat> most most stuff, things, yeah. right? Um but if the truck looks like it was looked after underneath there's a sign of grease all over the frame mm-hmm. to a certain extent of uh that's a sign that a guy was under there. Yeah, I know. I know. There's there's fellas owner operators that don't want to grease because grease is messy and that, you know, they have a show truck and and all those kinds of things and that's fine. Um, I I'd rather see a pile of grease under there. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere, like like grease is. Have you ever thought of uh, owning a multiple truck? Y- yes. <laughs> You sound so enthused. <laughs> Probably what what puts the brakes on is my expectations being yeah. being truthful are so high that finding somebody that fits my requirement already owns a truck. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Exactly. Yeah. And why wouldn't And they? and I work with I work very very closely and and they're clients of yours Mm -hmm. or of this firm um i work with those guys closely if i went down and i needed somebody to operate my truck i have a couple key guys if they were available because they had a driver in their truck Mm -hmm. they would run mine Mm -hmm. that's a couple in 20 (laughs) years uh i i i wish i i wish i could be I wish that could be a different story, and there would be a laundry list. Ah, it's it's not. Yeah, there's lots of good operators for sure. Yeah, there was a huge purge in the <clears throat> in the trucking industry um, of highly qualified uh, operators, and that was and the purge came in two thousand to two thousand and one, when the fuel price came up. Exactly when you got into the industry. Or whatever, uh, um, <clears throat> the entire trucking industry wasn't prepared for fuel surcharge or anything like that, and uh, uh, operators um, were were left hanging with contracts that basically um, bankrupt them. And there was there was literally farmers' fields full of trucks uh, back in two thousand two thousand and one, and a huge amount of guys left the industry. Then. Whether they whether they left the industry completely or the way they went to uh, um, a, as company drivers, I'm not exactly sure, but the the change in uh, um, in operators, there's the percentage of really serious operators who are looking at at uh, keeping solid equipment running well. It went from 60, 70 percent of the industry dropped down to 30, 40 percent of the industry and uh they're 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 still out there uh but they are a little bit harder to find today now they got guys who saying hey you know what i'm a lease operator today oh oh, really why you know what well i'm gonna see how it goes (laughs) you know it didn't think it through didn't like like uh you know no money down just walked in and 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 got it and surprisingly some of them do okay like uh, i think you got into it um probably the same way as I did, but I was a little bit more ridiculous. I bought my first truck. I didn't even have my class ones. I had my learners and my, and and my, uh, I think it was it, my brother-in-law or whatever. <laughs> he was driving and I was, and I was co-driving during this. It, it was ridiculous. I should never got a, uh, uh, um, 
I, I borrowed money, almost 100% down on the truck or whatever. It was ridiculous. Don't ever anybody do what, what I did to get. I was successful, but that was just because I was fearful of debt. Yeah. And everything that I had, just debt, 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 good, get, it, get, out, get out of debt. And, um, and uh, the, the ones who are really successful are the ones who are panic-stricken and motivated and focused to get out of debt. As soon as they're getting out of debt, then their life gets a little bit more easy. Then, then they can manage everything because there's a lot of surprises, you know, that there, just there's, boop, there, happen. There's a surprise around, every day around every corner. There's a surprise just, just waiting to pop up. Usually they're, they're not good surprises. They're, you know, there's always, whether it's a flat a nail in a tire or whatever, yeah. there's always something. Um, or did you you know did you when you did your pre-trip did you find something on the truck that that needed to be addressed yesterday it was fine today there's an air hose leaking yeah you know we're we're right around the corner we're gonna be 40 below we're gonna have air hoses leaking like crazy yeah um if you on the trucks that you are going to keep for extended periods of time, um, when you have down time in two or three or five years, whatever interval you decide, you change many of those airlines. Yeah. Um, Mr. Cold treats you well, and you usually don't have too many hissing. Yeah. Um, but you have to change them. Uh, it's 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 very important to when your truck is new or, or you have a good relationship with a parts department that you have some of those major hoses. And usually there's one, you know, your, your rear differential, as an example, will will have four brake hoses on it. Two of the four will be the same. The other two of the four will be the same. So have one of each of those in the bunk oh, yeah. or change them at home and keep the old ones in the bunk. In, it's, it very much sounds like if you really want to be a successful independent operator, you you have to fall in love with the work. You have to fall in love with the work. And you have to put, this is very controversial, you have to put the truck in front of the family. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. It's Sometimes, for sure. Or most, have you, or most. or have your spouse sitting beside you underneath? <laughs> Absolutely, taking notes or helping or pulling wrenches or holding wires. Yeah, um, for sure. If if the truck is not ready to go, yeah, it's a prop. It's expensive. Yeah. So everything you can do to make sure the truck is ready to go is on you. And um, if you have to miss some kind of event because the truck needs a little bit of attention yeah it's up to you to decide whether it's worth it or not um but certainly it's a bad decision to to push it off and think it's going to make it till the next time yeah. and usually you're fixing it in a truck stop or somewhere's down the road the, the expense is higher the downtime you don't want to be anywhere yeah. other than home so yeah. fix it at home and sleep in your own bed and and uh or fix it on the road yeah it's going to get you yeah yeah the 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 love of the actual ownership and uh taking care of something that mechanical uh, a, a a a great deal of really good operators just love the mechanics of everything just like okay well, this does that this does this this switches this and over there just the whole just the mechanic and the engineering uh, aspect of it. they love to flick this and do that and this and and that that really turns a lot of you know, a lot of drivers really on i really like uh, the the ones who would say oh you know what i'm just driving and i'm keeping between the ditches um um yes there's some who really like the road um but unless you really like the the mechanical aspect of it and this should do that and that should do that and then you maybe shouldn't own a truck maybe maybe not maybe not i do know i i have a i have a client who is extremely successful who does insane amount of miles um and buys a new truck every i think three years okay and uh, uh he he drives it's a husband and wife situation I think their truck payments, whatever, 
eight thousand dollars a month or something like that, and they're they're driving like twenty one twenty two thousand in a month, and they're just insane like that eight thousand eight eight thousand a month oh yes gosh. i know it's just it's insane i mean he makes it he's, he's doing it. i'm trying to convince him to to uh to to instead of buying a truck every three years just take one year and make it four years see if he can stretch it to four years because at the three-year mark or at the four-year mark the the residual value of that truck is almost nothing. There's there's no difference between the two in the in, in the market, and I say just if you get one more year out of there, you got basically almost a hundred grand, uh, because as soon as his payment is over, that's when he usually buys another one again, and he says you get an extra hundred grand, and it and I says you you'll have that thing paid for, uh, in in I think it's five or six years as opposed to eight to ten or twelve years. Yeah, that whole cycle. The way to make that decision would be knowing that truck for the first two to three. Yeah, and saying okay, this is the, the truck, this or is the this tr- isn't yeah, the truck. That's a, that's a good advice. That that's for sure. It, it, uh, absolutely. Now, whether he's going to do it, like he has no time for maintenance. Like he just flies all the time, and he's just three hundred and three hundred and ten, three hundred and fifteen days in a year uh, is traveling. Oh, yeah, I <laughs> know. He's the, no life. But I mean, um, uh, in the end, I think what, uh, uh, like he, he's going to be, he's going to be successful. It sh- should be okay. But it's, uh, if he, if he just gets that one extra year out of that in, in maintenance, but I, I like that point. Uh, you have to test the, the truck. The truck has to be right. Cause sometimes if it's a lemon, it now, no, <laughs> yeah, it talks to you. You, you know, like when you buy it new and by, by year three, you should have it figured out. Of course, everything, everything there, there's everything has a lifespan. Yeah. Um, and if if you can operate behind or or with the same thinking as as my ridiculous thinking, and replace things before they before that lifespan is up. Mm-hmm. Um, usually, you've fixed it at home. It never breaks down on the road. Yeah. And um, by year three, you know if, you know it's a keeper. Yeah, yeah, or at least w- one more year of a keep. Uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> exactly. right, but but at that point, you wouldn't necessarily want to want to follow my philosophy yeah. because if you're going to dump it in four years, you still want to maintain it as little as possible yeah. to keep. You want to keep it healthy on the road, safe on the road, but yeah. but not be throwing parts at it. Yeah, um, I generally maybe some guys would say you're throwing parts at it and usually i'm taking good ones off but yeah. most of them are in the bunk i yeah. i um so so where are you looking at now in your life uh, what are you looking at for retirement uh, how old are you now 54 54 oh you're a young guy yeah i <laughs> i i um can you see yourself retiring in five years 10 years 15 well hopefully 10 10 hopefully 65 hopefully but it seems the trucking industry, we have to work till we're 90. <laughs> um, I, would, I would like to, to think that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, will you keep your truck right to the end? I don't know if uh, that's a loaded question, too, because you don't know what's around the corner tomorrow. Sure, yeah. um, if somebody sideswipes you, then you have to... Th- yeah, can... I, I will keep it probably as long as possible. I've, I've made some major investment into it it's been very good to me um i have no reason to to get rid of it um i just keep maintaining and fixing and and upgrading and making things better as better can be yeah probably not invest in a new one yeah Uh, my uh, my brother uh, uh bought a brand new one in 1999 freightliner and uh and he still has it, and and it seems like every two years, in the last probably six or seven years, every year he says, "Do you, do you think it should trade off?" Should it? I said, "Nope, no, no, <laughs> you should, no, no. Just, just keep on doing it, keep on doing it." So he's owned it now for almost twenty five years. You know, it's almost a what do you call it, a collector's item or whatever. You know, but he he, he does it bumper to bumper. He, you know, gets in a little wire brush, cleaning off some rust and repainting. And <laughs> yeah, no, he's doing very well. I, 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 he's got the right. The right attitude the right truck yeah. um and yeah you keep it going mm. probably for me if if something happened and the truck 
for you know some like you said somebody sides swiped you or whatever yeah then you have to do i something. probably would um would the first thing i would do is knock on the door of uh some of the fellas i rub shoulders with and see if they want to sell theirs no if they no. want a clown to drive their truck oh <laughs> i think i could find well, or, you you would be able to get anybody to, like. I, I think I could find one or two yeah, that I would think you probably would. find find a, a spot for me. Sure. Um, I'm not sure at at that I'd be ready to jump into those kind of crazy payments. I, I think right. it's retarded. You, you the, that has to do with volume and and distance. Like true, but it's still the, like ridiculous. it is. It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, they the the husband and wife they they enjoy being on the road together. And they have a they have they a must. cycle and a system. Yeah, they must. And they and they and they and they do it um, consistently only for the miles. And it is, I I would still say they're in the they're in the two percentile. You know, somewhere in the two percent of people would would have a lifestyle like that. Because yeah. realistically, they have nothing else. Like they they drive and they have some sort of a vision for the future. Yeah. that they're going to do this, you know? And and hopefully, and, they, yeah, that, that makes sense, and they can stop driving at 55 or whatever yeah, and yeah. then enjoy some really key time in their life while they're still well. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I have quite a few family who have worked themselves like crazy, yeah. and uh, then they get to a certain point, they have an awful lot, uh, but they're so used to working that if they would come off, the, they would go nuts. So they just keep on working because... They 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 enjoy the work because they've they've done it for so long. They're so good at it. Uh, they they don't get a thrill about sitting uh, around s- and- sitting around with a with a beer in their hand on the <laughs> on, on the lawn chair. They would go nuts, you know, yes, yes. Uh, because it's it's they've trained their mind and their heart to focus on something for an extended period of time. They become so good at it. There's so much in, of their personal being involved in it. Uh, to try and retire, you have to you have to swap something. You'd have to find something else to to become excessively good at. Then, uh, at least yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I've seen them do. They just don't. Uh, not no, nobody in our in, that I've encircled. They nobody retires. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that probably is a is actually a healthy way. I, sometimes yeah. I think ultimate retirement, stopping working. I don't think it's good for the no, mind. I don't think so too. That's true. Well, my goodness, we have been, I have been completely enjoyed myself here. <laughs> this time's fl- flown like crazy. Uh, Gord, I, I really appreciate you, you coming out and, uh, and, uh, sharing your, your life like this. It's, uh, it's a great, and I'm, uh, I'm sure the, the, those listening are, have gleaned an awful lot about, uh, about the industry, at least from your perspective. Even, even one. Yeah. Even one point would be great. Sure. All right. Thank well you. then, uh, those of you who are uh, have been made it right to the end, uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining us with this podcast, and uh, have a great trip. If you want to learn more ways to become a professional independent operator, subscribe to this channel. If you want to support what we do, like, share, and turn on that notification.